Hey everybody, I know I'm late to the game, but it's time for my top 10 2019 reads, and I cannot wait to gush about these books one more time. So let's get started, or this video will be so very long. Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. It's Russell with Ink and Paper Blog. How are you doing today? It is time. It is finally time for me to upload my top 10 reads of 2019. If you guys haven't had a chance, look at my last video. It sort of explains the reason I'm late to this one, but I am super excited about these books. Now, I really have to be honest with you. This was so hard. 2019 was a phenomenal reading year for me. I read so many great books that the list as it started, I was so ugh, about crossing books off not to make this list. There were so many books. I will say I did a separate video where I um, called out my top six or is it my top nine? My top nine debuts that I read in 2019. That video is also going to be linked down below. Take a check at that one as well because another list of amazing books, amazing, amazing books for you guys. Um, I will start by saying that I was surprised by this list for a couple reasons. The first book I read in 2019 was Women Talking by Marion Taves and I was 100% sure that that book would be on this list at the end of the year. For about three quarters of it, I thought there was no way it wouldn't make the top 10 and it didn't make the top 10. So that goes to show you how amazing this reading year is, though I still loved, loved that book. Um, also, there are three nonfiction memoirs on this list, which is different for me. I normally do not have that much nonfiction that winds up on my top 10 at the end of the year, but these three books that will wind up in this list um, are 100% worth your time if you haven't read them already. Now, as always, get out your pen, get out your paper, get out your Goodreads, add these books to your uh, TBR if you haven't done that already. If you're so able, please order these books from your local independent bookstore. It really does help them, helps the author, supports them. Also, if you can, um, or if you are one of those people that get your books from the library, get your library to get you a copy so that you guys can read these if you haven't already, because I'm telling you, every single one of these is amazing. Now, I did do them in a top top 10 order. I think numbers sort of three through 10 have some flexibility. Numbers one and two are pretty solid, but the rest have some flexibility. But I definitely think that all of these books are worth your time. So let's get started. Number 10 on my list is The Collected Schizophrenias by Esme Weijian Wing out from Grey Wolf Press. I got to see Esme speak in person about this book at its book launch, and she is a phenomenal person and she has amazing style. I am an envy of her style as I look at her um, Instagram all the time. I just think it's amazing. And she has the cutest dog named Daphne. Um, yeah, so this book is a collection of essays that deal with Esme's uh, mental health throughout her um, sort of her beginning right before college, all through college to current day. What she does is she talks about her mental health in sort of a terms of how it affects her life or has affected her life, but also gives you the science and the history and the medical history of how mental health has been looked at in the United States and sort of how that has been problematic with the diagnosis of people um, and how they have had to deal with schizophrenia disorder, bipolar disorder, and how sometimes all of those are sort of clumped together when they can be very distinct. Um, this book is educational. This book is heartwarming. This book is tragic. This book is so well written, it at times you will just stop and be like, she is a master of the sentence. Um, I loved, loved, loved this book and I want more people to read it. And not to mention this cover is something fierce. So this is The Collected Schizophrenia's Essays by Esme Weijian Wing. And this is out from Grey Wolf Press. Get your hands on it, please. If you haven't already, it's amazing. The next book in my list is 
in South Africa. We are going to talk about If You Want to Make God Laugh by Bianca Marius. Now, this book was a book that was on my most anticipated reads of 2020, and it absolutely did not let me down. Now, Bianca is a fantastic person. She has an adorable dog named Muggle. So if you guys are represented in this list by your dog being a important factor in why I love you, that's okay with me. If You Want to Make God Laugh is the story of three different women in South Africa. We have a woman at the very beginning of the book who is attempting to commit suicide, more in an attempt, she says, to get the attention of her husband, who is at this point trying to divorce her. We have another woman who is doing religious work outside of South Africa. Um, she is an excommunicated nun. We learn a lot about that. It's very interesting. Um, but she has gotten news at the very beginning of the novel that someone has been injured and is in the hospital and may not make it, so she returns home. The third is a young black woman who has newly found out that she is pregnant and she is pregnant by the act of rape and what she is going to do and how that is going to affect her life and her family. Um, what happens here is that all of these stories sort of continue as they develop as people, but also as they intertwine. There are connections between all three of these women. And I'm not going to say anything because part of the joy of this book is the fact that as those stories come together, they they really do add to the narrative power. Bianca has a way of touching the human heart that is at times rare in literature. She has a way of just cupping you your heart and at times squeezing it so you feel a little of the pain, but letting it go and giving it a nice soft hug when you need to sort of just release into the beauty of her world, her people, and her characters. This book will make you cry. This book will also make you hopeful for the future. And it will also just be a great story. This is just a book you can absolutely get lost into. I loved it. If You Want to Make God Laugh by Bianca Marius. Love, love, love. Okay. This book I'm not going to actually talk a ton about because it's been talked a ton about, but it is absolutely in my opinion, the winner of the 2019 Booker Prize, and that is Girl, Women, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. This is sort of like a collection of interconnected short stories that are broken down into sections where we get a um, sort of a woman, a mother figure, and usually like a friend that is um, connected. It focuses really on the Black female experience in the UK in many different facets, from the immigrant experience, from the people, uh, for the young women that are actually born there, from the queer perspective. There is a fantastic section um, uh, in here from the point of view of a trans man that was, I think, one of the most fantastically written sections of the book and just had such a powerful story about identity and gender and fluidity and love that I, I yeah, I can't even. Um, and what she does here is this book is written in sort of like a narrative prose poem is how I'm going to say it. So it may take a minute for you guys to get used to that. Their punctuation and the capitalization are different than you're probably expecting. But just allow yourself to be um, sort of lulled into the narrative structure because it tells the story exactly how the story needed to be told. And that's Girl, Women, Other by Bernadine Bernadine Evaristo, winner of the 2019 Booker Prize. Um, and in the U.S., this is out in Black Cat. This is the U.K. edition that my friend got me, and I absolutely love it. Um, I lent out my paperback copy to my friend to read. So there you go. It seems weird at number seven to have such a juggernaut as Colson Whitehead, but that is how this year has gone. The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead should have won the National Book Award. I'm just saying it. I'm putting it. I'm putting it out there. This is a phenomenal novel about a young boy who gets put into a rehabilitation center incorrectly in Florida, and it is a horrible place where young boys were taken, especially young black boys, and horrible stuff was happening to them. And it's a story really about how that defined his life and the life of the people that he interacted with. Based on a true place, this book will break your heart. This book will open your eyes, and this book will prove to you that Colson Whitehead is probably in one of the literary, probably, that's not the right word. He is one of the literary masters writing in English today, and that is The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. Okay, 
Book number six is another, is another nonfiction. There you go. I'm trying to move these books around and be smooth about it. It's not going. And that is the memoir In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. This is also, oh, I should have told you guys, this is out from Doubleday. Sorry about that. I was trying to make sure that I do that. So if you want to make God laugh is out from, um, Penguin Random House, I believe. Let me make sure that I got that right. Um, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on that one, but you know how it is sometimes. Um, and then, um, gosh, I am a mess today. This is out from Putnam, which is an imprint at Random House. So not too off the charts there. Double day, there we go. And then this is out from Grey Wolf Press again. That was a bit of a mess of a section. Uh, in the Dream House is a memoir about Carmen's relationship with a woman who, that becomes mentally really abusive and later sort of formulates who Carmen believes that she is as a person due to the abuse that she is through, uh, goes through in the relationship. This book is structured in the idea of this house that is bought or rented, I believe, that they are, this couple is going to live in for their future. It's their dream house. But unfortunately, that dream very much does not go the way that Carmen expects it to. And she is very introspective regarding how this relationship has formed her and also takes a step back. What I One of the brilliant things about this book is when she's talking about the abuse of her um, partner at the time, she uses the second person you, which means that she's still taking a step back from that, that she's still there watching what had happened. And it is, I think, a brilliant narrative device. Um, I think it is fantastic. This book at times is heart-wrenching, but it's also so beautifully written that it's just amazing. Carmen Maria Machado's short story collection from a couple years ago, and this proved to me that she is a writer, 100% to watch. I will read everything that she puts out. And so that's In the Dream House, a memoir by Carmen Maria Machado, again, out from Great Wolf Press. So that was numbers six through 10. So we're gonna get started on numbers five through one. And number five is another memoir, and that is the phenomenal How We Fight for Our Lives by Saeed Jones. This is out for Simon & Schuster. I have raved, raved, raved about this book so many times on my channel that it's really impossible for me to say any more about it. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal story of a young queer black boy in Texas and him coming to terms not only with himself, himself, but also coming to terms with the relationship he has with his mother, which has its own difficulties. Uh, Saeed Jones is a poet by nature, and you can a hundred percent tell in this book that he has a way with every word that he uh, writes. Um, and he is just a phenomenal personality. He cracks me up on Twitter, but he also says so many poignant memorable, powerful things. This book really does delve into how he became himself, his sexual awakening, his objectific objectification, is that how I want to say that word, um, by different people who use him as a sexual object, um, and also how he sort of fits into his own narrative. Um, if you haven't read this book, please do. I think, if I'm not mistaken, don't quote me 100%, I think he reads the audio, and I may do that. I may have him read this book to me as well, um, because I think it would be even more powerful. So that's How We Fight for Our Lives, a memoir by Saeed Jones. One of the, uh, I talked about how Colson Whitehead, I think, is one of the greatest writers currently writing in America, and I'm going to say this woman is also one of the greatest writers. And she is amazing because she does it across so many genres and everything she puts out is so good. And this is Red at the Bone by Jacqueline Woodson. This is a slim gut punch of a novel. Now, the sort of the premise of this book is that it's the Sweet Sixteen party or the coming out party of a young girl. We find out that she is wearing the dress that her mother was going to wear at her Sweet Sixteen party, which she never wound up having because she became pregnant with her daughter. And what this book does is it goes through and it flips back between the perspectives of this young girl, her mother, her father, the grandparents, and it also sort of hovers around the um, 1920s 
I think that's the year, I apologize if I'm getting that right, Tulsa Massacre that occurred and how that played a role in sort of where this family wound up at the time of the story. And it is brilliantly done. And again, Jacqueline Woodson is also a poet by nature. So that there are times in this book that stop in a poetic moment that are just powerful. But this is really about finding yourself, finding your identity, finding out who you are within your family. Um, the mother and father of the young girl that have the baby at 16, they come from very different socioeconomic classes and how that sort of comes together and diverges. There's a really interesting discussion here regarding about the choices that are made once the baby is born, the choices made by the mother and the choices made by the father, um, which sort of flip the script a little bit. And I think that that is a powerful narrative for this book and also a discussion to be had. We can't always be expected to do what is expected of us. Sometimes we have to do what's best for us so that we can lead the life that we need to lead. Um, I loved, loved, loved this book. And at the end of this book, I bawled my freaking eyes out. So that is Red at the Bone by Jacqueline Woodson. This is a phenomenal audiobook, by the way. Jacqueline Woodson reads all of the third person perspectives, and then each character has a different actor who does their voice, and it is phenomenal. Highly recommend. It is a short little audiobook, um, but it is worth every minute. So that's again, Jacqueline Woodson read at the bone out from Riverhead Books. And I just love this cover. I can just sit here and look at it all day long. And I saw her and she signed it and I love her. Okay. Book number three, which fought very hard with book number two. So this was where it got super, super difficult. And that is The Man Who Saw Everything by Deborah Levy. This book I didn't expect to love this book as much as I did, but I loved it. So this book is sort of split into two narratives. At the very beginning of the book, we have a, a, a man who is almost hit by a car on Abbey Road, who is in a relationship with a woman that sort of takes a turn and they break up right before he's headed to Germany to do some in, um, academic investigation. He goes to Germany, he winds up having an affair with this man, and it's sort of all of this surreal stuff is going on. There's parts of the story where you're kind of trying to figure out what's real and what's not real, and you are sort of you're sort of on this verge. You don't know what's quite going on. You know that this events, these events are occurring, but you don't really understand how they play in the overall story. The second half of the book, we find that same man is in the hospital. He has been in an accident and it has affected his memory and his brain. And the characters that were present in the first section of the book become even more real in the second part of the novel, as we sort of kind of get an understanding of what has been going on and how all of the pieces come together. Um, this book has a way of keeping you on your toes, but also it's a man in bed, ill. So like, there's a lot of nothing that has so much poignancy that you are just driven in the narrative. I love this book. It is so very, very, very good. I actually have never not liked anything I've read by Deborah Levy, so I don't know why I haven't put her in my official authors that I love section. She really should be. Um, but yeah, The Man Who Saw Everything by Deborah Levy. I, you guys, this is a really, really good. Really, really good. I think it's, I know it was long listed for The Man Booker, but I kind of feel like it slid under the radar a little bit. Book number two is a book that I have talked about a hundred times on my channel because I want everybody to read it. And that is, isn't this cover phenomenal? Oh, I should say that this is out from Bloomsbury. I have to thank Bloomsbury because they sent me this beautiful finished copy. So thank you very, very much. The Memory Police by Yoka Agawa is a book I read in the middle of the year and it has never gotten out of my head. Now this was uh, this is out from Pantheon. It was shortlisted for the National Book Award in Translated Fiction. It is translated from the Japanese by Steven Schneider. Let me make sure I got that right. Um, I, I said that like I knew. Steven Schneider, good job, Russell. Um, this is the story of an island where items disappear from the overall con uh, consciousness of the people by a random decision. So the government decides today that apples don't exist anymore. So all the apple trees are destroyed and all the apples must get be, must be gotten rid of. Um, what winds up happening here is that we have a young woman whose mother disappeared, we learned, 
early in the novel, but she has found that someone that's very close to her can remember objects even once they are gone. Most people cannot. And there are the, this group called the memory police that come around and they make sure that you're adhering to the rules and he would be taken away should it be known that he could that he holds on to these memories. And so this becomes a, di a discussion regarding memory and regarding the importance of people and also the importance of objects in our overall life. Do we need objects to have substance? Do we need things or objects? Uh, uh, things, I guess that's a good word, things in order to have purpose. Do they make us relevant to other people? Um, so there's a lot of discussion regarding memory and sort of ownership and all that kind of stuff in here. But then we also have a tale of a woman who's just trying to save a man that she loves, not um, so much. He is her, her editor. She's a writer in the book. Um, and she really wants to save him from what could happen to him. Um, I flew through this book. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. The translation is awesome. And I think this cover is gorgeous. Gorgeous. And I really loved it. It is my number two book of 2019, The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa, translated by Stephen Schneider out from Pantheon Books. Last but certainly not least, the number one book that I read in 2019 is The Revisioners by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. This was one of my most anticipated books of 2019. I was dying to get my hands on this. She um, was long listed for the National Book Award for her prior debut novel, A Kind of Freedom, which I really, really liked, but The Revisioners is even better. This is really the story of two women in two different time periods. We have um, we have Ava, who is our modern narrator. I think it's in 2017. Yes, 2017. She is a mixed race young woman who has sort of hit hard times and winds up moving in with her white grandmother. And there are dynamics there, race dynamics, that are really flushed out throughout her narrative as she's really trying to make decisions to make the best life for herself and her son. We also have her grandmother's narrative, Josephine, who is, um, Josephine has two sections. She has um, the 1800s, end of the 1800s, where she is a young girl, a slave, um, and her and her mother and father are going to flee into freedom. And there's a lot of narrative regarding that. And then there's a 1924 section where her and her husband have bought land that they had previously worked on. They've bought it, now they share it, and a young white girl moves in across the street with her husband and that dynamic and what winds up happening there. I want to tell you guys all sorts of stuff about this book. I could talk about the the story 100%, but part of the beauty of this book is at each turn that happens, you really need to experience without me ruining any piece of that. Really, you need to just go into this book with as little as knowledge as possible. There is a slight sort of magical realism section to this book that I think adds to the power of the narrative. Um, this book just, it sort of falls into the light. When we're looking, now that um, Toni Morrison has passed, we're looking for books that sort of carry on that amazing literary legacy. This is one of those books. When I finished this book, I felt like Margaret Sexton, uh, Wilkerson, and Sexton is the future that Toni Morrison sort of laid down with her brilliance. Um, this book is phenomenal. It breaks your heart. It will make you look at the world in different ways. And it is so, so good. And it is so beautifully written. Please read it. And that's The Revisioners by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton out from Counterpoint. Counterpoint, you know I love you. Thank you so much. I actually got this one at the Great I think it's called The Good Great Bookstore in Oakland, California, where I saw Margaret. I think it was on her last tour stop. I got her to sign this book. Um, and I totally, um, I have such a book crush on her that it, it just hurts. So that's The Revisioners by Margaret Wilkerson Sexton. And that is my number one book read of 2019. I told you this video would be a little bit long. I'm a little bit rusty because it's been a bit of time since I've been here, but I hope all 10 of these books wind up on your TBR. If you have not read them already, please email me, comment below. I will be back. I'll be getting back into the, the swing of things now. And um, we can discuss any of these books you would like to. I would love, love it. Please, when you buy them, tell me, talk to me, love it. As always, I super, super thank you if you're a return subscriber. If you are new to my channel, please subscribe. Come back for more books, books, books. That's what I do over here. Also, if uh, you, um, as I always say, sorry, gosh, I am rusty at this. As I always say, 
shop locally, read globally. Until next time, I wish you happy reading. Bye.